Members, it's time for questions to the Minister of Health. I call Dr. Kiva Archibald, the Eirin Mair and Dr. Kiva Archibald. Um, I can call you Kester Verhey and let a whole question one, please. Um, I, I thank the member for a question. The clinical service that provides paediatric ankle and foot orthosis are provided mainly by orthotists through contracted services to the health and social care trusts. There are two service providers in Northern Ireland, one of whom manufactures AFOs in Northern Ireland, and the production lead times for AFOs are about three weeks from assessment to delivery to the trusts, with an urgent orders being able to be completed within a week for patients who are post-operative or inpatients. Service level for orthotists service varies across uh, trusts. Children with SEN are able to access the service via consultant, GP or allied health professional referrals in some trusts, and in others the referral sources are more limited. Some of the paediatric caseload are seen within a special school clinic by the orthotists, and school clinics are either weekly, fortnightly or monthly, depending upon the school. Most children who attend these schools should be cast and supplied with their AFOs within a month. Only pupils who attend these schools are able to be seen within these clinics. All other paediatrics are seen at general clinics across a variety of hospitals. Typically, waiting times come vary from trust to trust and depend upon how the services are delivered. At clinics, the availability of appointments determine the delivery speed and access of services. Paediatrics are usually prioritised over routine patients who are seen at the clinics, but would mainly be seen within a general clinic where adults are also seen. The typical waiting time between paediatric appointments is between 6 and 12 weeks. I fully recognise there is a constant need to review service delivery models, including paediatric orthotists, as children's need for replacement devices are often more demanding due to the growth and general wear and tear. As part of the AHP Workforce Review Programme, an orthotist workforce review was taken forward. This identified a number of issues, including variations in service delivery and access to services. As a result, the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer has asked for one of her trust podiatric heads of service to take forward a review of orthotist services across Northern Ireland, and the intention is to have that review completed by October 2021. I thank the Minister for, for that comprehensive answer. And I have been contacted by constituents who have children who require these orthotics, and I have written to you about one child in particular on a couple of occasions, because they find that the orthotics provided cause pain and injury to, to the children's little feet. Um, and then they have been forced to source um, alternatives uh, privately, which are obviously very expensive. As you, as you mentioned yourself, children's feet grow. Um, so would the department commit to evaluating the quality of the paediatric orthotics provided to ensure that they, they are fit for purpose? Um, I, I thank the member for, for, for her question. I do know she has written to me on this, this point. With regards to the quality of orthosis provided, the device can either be custom made for the child from an impression taken off the child's leg and foot, or if suitable, an off-the-shelf prefabricated ankle and AFO can be utilised. Um, the regulations provide more stringent requirements on the manufacture of any medical device, and this also includes orthotic devices and manufactured by the orthodist service. The guidance and standards for best practice are those from the British Association of Prosthetics and Orthotists guidelines for the provision of orthotic services, and the guidance sets out the quality of the fabrication of devices, and these standards will also apply to all the patients. But also, as the member noted in my response to you, I did say our chief allied health professional would undertake a review, which is due back uh, to be completed by October 2021, and I asked her to include the member's query in that as well. Call Paula Bradshaw. Um, Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, I had a, a meeting with a consultant in orthotics recently. There, recently, and it very much echoed um, the um, other members' comments around that. But just on a broader point, Minister, one of his concerns was that the the um, um, managers within the health trust are not necessarily allocating enough theatre time for the um, procedures in relation to um, the, the children's feet and legs. I'm just wondering how this is actually fitting into the regionalisation prioritisation programme in terms of um, theatre capacity, because a lot of um, intervention, uh, the earlier you get there and, and, and correct the issue, the better. Thank you. And I thank the member, and she will be aware that I've published, or the trust have published, their rebuilding plans for the next three months, where we are looking about the, the rescheduling and the utilisation 
of our theatre capacity at a regional level rather than just solely within the trust level as well. So it's about how we rebuild core services across the entirety of the spectrum, uh, including some of these very invaluable preventative operations that can take place as well. But first of all, you know, we are tackling those red flags, those immediate urgent responses as well, why we rebuild uh, our service back to where it should be and where it can be. I call Jim Allister. I asked the Minister generally about the supply line of medical devices and products uh, and indeed medicines and how that has been impacted by the protocol. Where do we source most of our supplies? How is the protocol impacting on that? Uh, how does he anticipate at the end of the grace period how that will work? And what awaits us from the 1st of January next year when we come fully under restrictive EU laws? Um, and, and I thank the member for, for that point. It is something that is topical at the minute. Uh, something was raised at the Health Committee uh, last week as well. We currently uh, receive 98% of our medicines and medical devices directly through GB. So the protocol will have a, an implication and is ha isn't having a, a current implication because we have a derogation to the end of this year. But what the, the triggering, triggering of Article 16 towards the end of last year in regards to vaccines has unnerved uh, suppliers while there is a, a train of work in progress between my department, the DHSC, the Medic, uh, MHRA, as well, who are also involved in this, it did have an unsettling effect. We are seeing those consistent suppliers who are now asking more questions, who are now concerned about the implication of the protocol. So that's why we're engaged with those companies to give that level of reassurance that ourselves and the Department of Health and Social Care are doing all that we can that is within our remit and our power to ensure that those uh, supply lines are as seamless uh, as possible. The Northern Ireland office also holds a, a, a not insignificant financial pot to be able to facilitate and support that as well, and we're engaged with them as to how we utilise that best to make sure there is no disruption to medicines or medical devices uh, in Northern Ireland due to the protocol and its outworkings. I call Robbie Butler for questions. Number two, please. I thank the member for, for his question. The Lisburn Primary and Community Care Centre at the Lag and Valley Hospital uh, will provide fit-for-purpose accommodation for seven GP practices, uh, selected acute outpatient services and a large number of trust services, many of which will be re relocated from the existing Lisburn Health Centre, uh, Warren's Children's Centre and other lease premises, namely TSL House. The new development will help uh, enable greater management of chronic conditions in the community and closer to patients' homes through the co-location and integration of GP practices alongside multidisciplinary teams in a functionally suitable building. Construction of a new primary and community care centre is progressing well and is scheduled for completion in June 2021. And following a period of commission, commissioning, it is anticipated that the building will open to patients in late autumn of, or winter of this year. Robbie Butler for supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for his answer. And Minister, you did mention about the role for multidisciplinary teams. Would you uh, agree with me that the inclusion, uh, particularly with regard to mental health in these settings, such as the Lisburn Primary and Community Centre, will have a more holistic, uh, better outcome in terms of wellbeing for uh, our community? And again, I, I thank the member and has no interest, especially in regards to mental health supports and, and provision. The primary care multidisciplinary team model uh, introduces new uh, physiotherapy, social work and mental health roles into GP practices to work alongside enhanced levels of nursing staff and the existing practice team. It aims to move from a system of treating illness to holistically supporting good physical and mental health and social well-being. Within the South Eastern Trust area, MDTs are already being fully implemented in the Down GP Federation, accompanied by a small introduction jointly in Ards and North Down. While formal evaluation of the MDT programme is currently underway, it is clear that the model is already impacting positively on some of the core services within the South Eastern Trust, such as physiotherapy and mental health. My department and the Health and Social Care Board are currently engaged in a process to develop a roadmap for the implementation of MDTs across all the remaining MP federations, including Lisburn. And this involves engaging with those in general practice and the health and social care trusts to agree realistic and achievable proposals which will then be aligned with overall strategic priorities and the current or emerging pressures. 
Development of the roadmap is expected to be completed before summer 2021 and will enable robust planning around the cost and timescale of the rollout of the model for the remainder of Northern Ireland. Further rollout of the model is, however, dependent on the availability of a suitably qualified and experienced workforce, readiness of accommodation and the appropriate funding. But MDTs are not the only initiative in place to support those working in primary care. Dear Mayor Liz Kimmins, for your cash to call Liz Kimmins for a question. Gormelga, pre last can call you and thank the Minister for his answer. And it's good to hear the progress in Lisburn. Um, as a former employee in Lisburn Health Centre, I know a lot of my, my past colleagues will be delighted to hear it's progressing as it is. So Minister, it was just to ask for an update on the, the Newry Community Treatment and Care Centre um, and just what funding has been set aside for new primary care hubs. Gormelga. And I thank the member I thank her for her support as well. I'm sure our, our former colleagues will be pleased too that we are making some positive progress in that area. Uh, the Newry Community Treatment and Care Centre project involves the provision of a new 12,600 square metre primary care facility to provide fit for purpose accommodation for GMS services, selected acute outpatient and diagnostic services, and a large number of multidisciplinary teams, many of which will be relocated from outlying sites and lease premises. The project was originally initiated under ministerial direction in March 2013. The Newry project experienced delay primarily as a result of protracted negotiations over planning permission between the contractor and Newry Moran and Down District Council, but planning permission was approved on 1 July 2020. Departmental officials are currently considering whether the project should now move to full business case stage, and I will update the member when that is received. Here, Mayor John O'Dowd, for your case, I call John O'Dowd for a question. John O'Dowd, can call you case number three, question number three. And again, I, I thank the member for, for his question. Uh, the primary care multidisciplinary team model introduces new physiotherapy, social work and mental health roles into GP practices uh, to work alongside enhanced level of nursing staff and the existing practice team. It aims to move from a system of treating illness to holistically supporting good physical and mental health and social well-being. Like many transformation projects, the expansion of the programme has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the MTT model is currently in development in five areas across Northern Ireland, Londonderry, West Belfast, Causeway, Newry and District and North Down and Ards, and is already fully implemented in the Down GP Federation. In total, across all the areas, the programme supports over 300 members of staff. My department and the Health and Social Care Board are currently engaged in a process to develop the roadmap, as I indicated early, earlier, and this involves engaging with all those in general practice and the trusts to agree the realistic and achievable proposals, which will then be aligned with the overall strategic priorities or current and emerging pressures. That roadmap, as I said, is due to be completed before summer 2021 and will enable robust planning around the cost and timescale for the rollout. But further rollout of the model, as I have already said, is dependent on the availability of suitably qualified and experienced workforce and the readiness of accommodation and appropriate funding. John O'Dowd. Supplementary question for John O'Dowd. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. The minister, would the Minister agree with me that if we are to turn the oil tank around that is the health service, that we have to concentrate on primary as much as acute, and perhaps more in primary. Uh, I understand that there's only five of the 17 multidisciplinary teams have been established. And if we were to establish them, then surely that would take a significant amount of pressure off GPs on the acute service. The Minister may be interested to know that in recently in social media in my area, parents were asking each other how often they had to phone their GPs to get through. The dubious winner was 400 times to hit read out and get through the GP. And many of those patients will be simply seeing their GP to be redirected to another service. They, it would appear to me these MDTs would be the answer to much of that problem. Um, I, will, uh, I would fully agree with the member about the, the, the benefit that the MDTs will bring, because it is about that multidisciplinary disciplinary, multi -disciplinary team aspect. When they were first initiated or first even talked about here, there was much reluctance about somebody going to a GP thought they had to see the GP. But when they saw the, the aspects of being able to see a physiotherapist, a nurse practitioner or even a pharmacist face to face rather than having to wait to engage with the GP, they saw the benefits. Our GP colleagues see the benefits as well. And experience to date has shown that many of those actually working in MDTs 
have been recruited already from existing roles within health and social care trusts. So recruitment to our MDT roles must therefore be progressed through that measured approach as well, so that we are not robbing Peter to pay Paul and actually shifting the same staff around in the service. But the members' comments uh, and analogy of the health service being that oil tanker that needs turned round, um, we do need to start turning it and turning it very fast. It has been able uh, to reposition itself pretty quickly over the past 14 months, but we need to make sure that the support is there uh, to turn it round, to get it parked and to get it into a place that actually supports the entirety of Northern Ireland, and that includes investment in primary care, secondary care, but also across the workforce of the health and social care family. Call Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Minister, the, the rollout of the multidisciplinary teams is of vital importance going forward. We, we realise that, and, it's, and it is very important to, to, uh, to note, as the previous member has just spoken about, that the, the pressure that GPs are under is much greater, and that is uh, primarily due to the switching off of healthcare appointments during this pandemic. And that much of these um, calls and queries and from uh, patients, they are dealing with patients who have not been dealt with in secondary care. So, given the disparity around the access to GPs across Northern Ireland, what work is being done to ensure that GP access um, does not continue to be a barrier in early diagnosis of life-threatening conditions? And basically, what I am asking you is, Mr. When will we see face-to-face -face appointments being made readily available? to the public for GPs. Um, and I thank the Vice Chair um, of the Committee for her points. Um, I would not agree with the switching off uh, term that was used, but I would say that we had to take drastic steps uh, during serious waves of a COVID pandemic, which ser put serious pressure on the entirety of our, our health, for health workforce. In regards to GP practices, I want to be clear that our general practices are open. They have been open throughout this pandemic, and I want to pay tribute to the hard work, commitment and innovation we have seen from our GPs as they continue to provide critical service for us all. Mm -hmm. GPs have continued to see patients. Indeed, the number of consultations is now close to pre-pandemic levels, with the most recent figures for the week ending on the 16th of April showing 83 consultations per thousand, which compared with uh, November 2019, where there were 87 consultations per thousand. Indeed, despite the need for social distancing and infection control, GPs have been able to maintain face-to-face -face consultations um, at a level. Of those recent consultations, 37% were face-to-face, -face, in comparison with 50% in November 2019. As I think it is clear from the outset of this pandemic, our GPs have worked tirelessly for the good of everyone in the community. Not only have they delivered a range of additional services, including COVID centres, vaccinations, but they have remained focused on continuing to deliver core vital services. And we owe all of them a huge debt of gratitude for the work they have done. But I will acknowledge and recognise that that level of uh, service is not consistent across all GP practices, and there are a small number who have not stepped up uh, to the mark and the expectation of even their own <coughs> colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Uh, my question refers also um, to the point made by the previous speakers. Understandably, there is deep frustration and concern with not getting face-to-face -face appointments. I think we're all hearing it from from all of our constituents. Um, so, just off the back of that, can I ask uh, what conversations you have with both patients and GPs on the conversation of having face-to-face -face appointments resuming as soon as possible? Thank you. I think, um, as I have said before and actually referenced in the, the answer to the previous speaker as well, in regards to the increase that we have seen in those face-to-face -face consultations and how we are now comparing to where we were uh, in November 2019, that situation is improving uh, in regards to the GP's face-to-face -face consultations. But, but I think we need to be clear as well that the experiences that many patients are receiving in access and GP appointments is comparable to where it was pre-COVID as well, because it wasn't good or wasn't to a level of service then as well, because we did see a decrease in the number of GP practices across Northern Ireland, as well as the number of GPs actually working across Northern Ireland as well. So I do want to pay tribute and support my GP colleagues within the healthcare family who are stepping out up and who have went uh, above and beyond and, and working in COVID centres and vaccination centres and have supported their patients throughout this time. 
they, like me, want to get back uh, to a normal health service that we've seen in the past, and that will be replicated, and the members had those representations uh, from the Royal College of GPs and the British Medical Association at the committee uh, as well, and she knows the input that they're putting in uh, through the health professionals and those organisations to returning our health services as much as possible to face-to-face -face consultations, but also realising that the pressures that it is currently still under. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for your answers so far, and hopefully these all-in-one stops will improve accessibility of the care of all patients. Can you, Minister, give, his, give your assessment of the impact of the MDT model so far? And I thank the member for, for her point. Uh, the, the impacts of the MTTs I have you know, indicated in, in, in the original answer as well, because the programme actually provides more care closer to people's homes and improves access to early support and diagnosis um, by proactively managing patient need in their local GP practice, setting through a multidisciplinary early intervention team. And as I said in the answer to the original questioner in regards to what professionals they can actually access. During 1920, across the five sites, a total of 41,459 first contact physio appointments were made, 86 per cent of which were managed within primary care, uh, and only 12 per cent received onward referrals. Continuing the rollout of primary care MDTs will support the transformation of service provision in the context of a rapidly changing landscape of treatment options, workforce gaps, and the opportunities for change. And given the innovative nature of this approach, learning and evaluation are key elements of the MDT programme. The effectiveness of MDTs is being reviewed on an ongoing basis through an independent evaluation. And although year one of this evaluation has been heavily impacted by COVID, work is ongoing to address these challenges. Here I'm there. Karen Mullen for Hanya Cash. I called Karen Mullen. Mr. Mayor, would last can call you a question for Minister. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll take question four on question twelve um, together, and if I could ask for additional time in response to the answer. Alcohol and drug services across the North West are provided through a combination of primary and secondary care services commissioned by the Health and Social Care Board, along with the prevention treatment and support services commissioned by the Public Health Agency. All of these are in line with the Regional Alcohol and Drugs Commissioning Framework, Northern Ireland's overarching public health strategy, Making Life Better, and the Executive's current substance use strategy, the new strategic direction for alcohol and drugs, Phase 2. Resources for alcohol and drug services will continue to be managed on a regional basis, and future funding for addiction services will be reviewed in line with the forthcoming substance use strategy which addresses the needs of the Northern Ireland population as a whole, including the North West. The Western Health and Social Care Trust Community Addiction Services consists of a core multidisciplinary team supplemented by a number of more specific services, including link and liaison nurses, opiate substitution therapy services, home detox detoxification services, and an innate bedded uh, complex detoxification and stabilisation inpatient unit. The service offers the full range of treatment options and receives approximately 2,500 referrals per year. For the majority of patients where detox is required, withdrawal can be managed in the community as part of the shared care detox programme. And the Western Trust is the only trust currently providing a home detox service within Northern Ireland. For the most complex cases, the ASHA Addiction Treatment Unit in Noma as one of the three regional inpatient complex detoxification and stabilisation units, the other two being Shimna in the South Eastern Trust and Carrick One in the Northern Trust. Together, these three units provide 30 inpatient beds for complex detoxification and stabilisation across the region. Residents from any trust area can avail of treatment in any of the units of their choice. The SHA is an eight bedded a uh, unit providing a six-week inpatient programme, but currently has seven beds in operation, with the eighth bed being utilised as an isolation room if required due to COVID. This unit currently has a waiting list of 25 individuals for inpatient treatment, and as an independent provider of Tier 4 rehabilitation services, the Northland Centre is part of the regional network. Tier 4 addiction services for Northern Ireland providing counselling inpatient treatment 
and aftercare counselling services to achieve recovery for those with alcohol and drugs addictions, along with support counselling for families. Northlands offers a range of addiction treatment services, both residential and in the community, to individuals, couples and families with drug and alcohol problems. Most of its services are provided in its purpose-built facilities in Londonderry, with outpatient counselling services also operating in Coleraine and Mockerfield. I would just remind the Minister of the two-minute rule, but given the importance of the topic, I would continue there. Uh, Kesh Dorlinta, Karen Mullen, a supplementary question for Karen Mullen. Thank the Minister for his extensive answer, um, uh, and I also thank you for agreeing to meet Tamsin White, um, who recently lost her mum. You will hear from her around the lack of detox services, particularly for females in the North West region and the real impact it's having. You responded to me, um, particularly even this morning, around the New Decade New Approach Commitment and that funding will be decided at a joint board of the Secretary of State, the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister. Health Minister, I'm asking you, are you taking forward to that joint board that this commitment, that, uh, that, that this is a commitment, needs to be funded and should be a priority? Um, and, and I think that the member for appointed, as I, as I said earlier, in regards to the funding uh, under the section of addressing Northern Ireland's unique circumstances within New Decade, New Approach, there is a, a number of funding shortfalls, uh, and it is anticipated that the level of funding made available will not be sufficient to cover all the areas set out in New Decade, New Approach. However, as I said, it is my understanding that specific projects um, this funding is aimed at supporting are to be to determined by a joint board which includes the Secretary of State and the First and Deputy First Ministers. Neither my department nor the Health and Social Care Board nor the Public Health Agency have been involved directly in this process to date, but we would obviously welcome any further investment in substance use services. However, this needs to be in line with the identified need and or priorities for service development within the strategic commissioning and planning processes. And as the member is aware that the number of funding shortfalls that I have within my current budget due to new decade new uh, approaches or agreements being made without necessary funding being attached is the challenge. So I would encourage her uh, to lobby her party member who is part of that assessment board in regards to the funding process. Mark Durkin for your question. Uh, Mark Durkin for a question. Uh, I would like to thank the Minister for his answers thus far. My supplementary question is almost as similar as my original was uh, to, to Ms Mullins. I also look forward to meeting the Minister when it comes to meet uh, young Tasman and Foyle, myself, Karen and, and all our reps look forward to that engagement. But could I ask the Minister to give a commitment that he will use his office and his influence, along with the undeniable evidence that exists of need to exert pressure on the Executive Office and the Northern Ireland Office to honour the pledge in new decade, new approach for a new addiction unit in the North West, and they will have no shortage of support in doing so. And I, I thank the member for, for his commitment for support, uh, because he will be aware that there are many uh, proposals and new decade, new approach that are health specific. Uh, I do not have the reassurance of that funding um, either in the coming budget or this year's budget because there is no funding allocation directly aligned to those at present. It is priorities and promises that have been made by the Finance Minister in regards to funding those, but it will be up to the project board, uh, which includes the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, and the Secretary of State in prioritising those. Uh, in regards to funds that are made available. He will be aware, as Minister of Health, I will be asking and pushing for as much of that money to come in our, decade, our, our direction as is possible, because many of those commitments in New Decade New Approach are necessary for not just the advancement of health, the health service in Northern Ireland, but much of the transformation uh, as well, which is sorely needed. Time for a very quick question from Roy Beggs. A minimum price of alcohol can contribute to reduction in uh, consumption of alcohol and associated addiction. Can the Minister provide us uh, an update on that? Because if we can reduce the consumption of alcohol, the pressures on our addiction support will be reduced. I, I think the member was raised uh, earlier on in the, in the British Irish Council statement because it was something that was discussed. I believe that the introduction of legislation for minimum unit pricing for alcohol has the potential to be a key population level health measure to address this issue. I have therefore made a commitment to have a full consultation on minimum unit pricing once our new substance use strategy 
is finalised, and this consultation will examine a range of possible options in respect of alcohol pricing, which will include consideration of the emerging evidence of the effectiveness of minimum unit pricing following its implementation in Scotland and elsewhere. Thank you, members. That concludes the period of listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And before I start there, question number six and question number seven both have been withdrawn. So I call Rachel Woods for first question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister be aware that early, early medical abortion services were suspended in the Western Trust on Friday. Can the Minister clarify who the conscientious objection provision in the Abortion NI No. 2 Regulations 2020 apply to? I, I think the member will apply to, to anyone who wishes to take up that that, that um, option that has been there. But again, my department was informed on Friday of a temporary pause to the Western Trust's early medical abortion service. Uh, and my department will continue to monitor ongoing efforts by the Trust to restore delivery of those services with minimum disruption. At this stage, it is not known how long services will be paused in the Western Trust. It is my understanding that efforts are ongoing to put additional staff in place as soon as possible and to resume provision of an EMA service with the minimum of disruption. Rachel Wood for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, it is my understanding that there have been instances of some staff working across trusts who have been frustrating service delivery by refusing to, say, perform administrative tasks. Can the Minister outline what instruction or guidance his department has given to all the trusts in Northern Ireland in relation to this matter? In regards to ad administration, uh, of the service which has been delivered by trusts. It will be up to the trust to de deliver that as well. However, my, trust has, uh, my department has advised trusts that abortion is now legal and the regulations require such terminations to be carried out on health and social care premises by registered uh, medical professionals. The, the EMA pathways were put in place by trusts starting from April 2020 in line with their statutory duties and functions to provide medical care and treatment in accordance with the needs of the patients and subject uh, to the law. I call Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And just on the same subject, uh, uh, Minister, I wholeheartedly welcome the suspension. I believe it is an answer to prayer, and I do continue to pray that it will remain in suspension, unable to reopen again. But can I ask you, as Minister, to give some indication? As to the extent of the resource issue you and your department will be faced with, should you be compelled to commission such services across the health and social care system? I thank the member for, for his question. Uh, that scoping piece of work is something that has been currently carried out, uh, as it was a piece of work that was initially commissioned by my permanent secretary during the, the period where there was no minister in place. That has recommenced uh, following. Uh, an easing of pressures due to COVID, and it is something that is actually being reported to and engaged with with the Northern Ireland Office. Thomas Buchanan for a supplementary. Again, thank the Minister for his response. And I have to say that it is of extreme concern that there are still those in this House who, have, who are constant advocates and cheerleaders for a premeditated murder of the unborn child through the mechanism of abortion. And we saw that again from uh, Saturday's newsletter. Would the Minister agree? that it would be much better to ensure that we have proper help and support services in place for mothers-to-be who may feel vulnerable and unable to cope, rather than advocating the destruction of the unborn child. And can he advise where he and his department are currently at in ensuring that such services are readily available in every trust area for all those who need to avail of them? Again, uh I, I note the member's point uh, that he is making. There is a duty uh, to deliver uh, abortion services now on the trusts across Northern Ireland due to the decision that was taken uh, during the period where this place uh, did not sit. Uh, it is also a duty, uh, I think, uh, that we need to support mothers and potential mothers as well with every physical and psychological support that we can uh, as a health and social care service no matter what their decision should be in regards to abortion, because that duty is there uh, for one I think that we deserve to deliver uh, for the women of Northern Ireland. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, 
Can the Minister confirm that there is a threat of his budget being top sliced by the Finance Minister in an effort to fund the Northern Ireland Victims' Pension? Um, I, I, I thank the member um, for, for his question. Uh, in regards to uh, the concern that he has raised, um, I, I very much welcome the announcement of the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme, um, or Victims' Pension as previously known. Whilst uh, the TEO and the Department of Justice are leading on the design and administrative functions of the scheme, there will also be a cost associated with, with it. And I must say, however, I am deeply concerned that it has been suggested, uh, even by the Finance Minister in this ho House, uh, that the costs uh, associated with it uh, should be seen as reduction to, to Department's resource budgets uh, simply on a pro rata basis. Uh, and it may be required to fund the payments. Whilst the payments no doubt need to be made, I hope all members will agree with me that top slicing uh, a health service that has never been as stretched as it currently is would be deeply damaging and a detrimental step to take. Alan Chambers for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for his answer there. Uh, Minister, like yourself, uh, I certainly welcome the pension, not least because it, uh, it was so long overdue. Uh, people will be deeply concerned if the Finance Minister is simply going to cut budgets of some of the most important services to pay for it. Can the Minister confirm what level of a cut his department is potentially facing and what impact that would have on key health and social care services and, in particular, his recovery programme? Um, and I thank the member, while um, the costs are, are still to be determined on a pro rata basis, um, my department could be facing a cut of many tens of millions of pounds um, each and every year. Uh, needless to say, a budget reduction of that magnitude would seriously undermine our ability to fund all of our most fundamental health and social care services. Um, after a decade of underinvestment and the desperate need to rebuild after COVID, the last thing our health service needs is such a deep cut to its annual budget, and I sincerely hope that the Finance Minister uh, can find an alternative way forward, as I say, for um, a welcome announcement in regards to the payment uh, of the Victims' Pension or the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme, as it is probably known. I call Paul Given. Um, in our post-primary education settings, children are being uh, required to wear face masks. Um, I am sure others have received complaints from parents of their child having headaches, exhaustion um, as a result of wearing it for six hours per day, five days a week. In light of the very impressive reduction of transmission rates, hospitalisation rates, at what stage uh, will the guidance which the Minister for Education and indeed the Children's Commissioner, whom I have spoken to about these issues, um, will be changed as it is based upon the Chief Medical Officer and the Department of Health? I, I thank the member uh, for, for his question. And in fact, the introduction of face coverings in post primary school settings was done at a request uh, and consideration from the Education Minister as a step to, to allowing the reopening. But I'm sure if he puts forward a, a request for that to be considered and looked at in regards to updated medical advice and guidance, it's something the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor would do. Supplementary for Mr Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, that's interesting because that's not what's coming back in written responses to questions, that this is based upon the CMO and the Department of Health advice. Uh, so I would welcome that clarity between the two departments because certainly there is a concern uh, the children as young as 12 and 13 are being required to wear face masks for this very protracted period of time, uh, which I think everyone would accept, would accept is uh, more than challenging um, in a school environment to do that. Can the Minister also clarify why affiliated sports clubs are able to put on five-a-side football, for example, but an unaffiliated group of players are not allowed to play five-a-side football? Uh, and again, I, I, th I thank the member in regards to his initial point, uh, in regards to differentials between where the responsibility lies. One thing I have found in the last 14 months, um, if any minister gets queried in regards to regulations, it usually ends up being my fault or turned round so that it is on the basis of my department or the chief medical officer or the chief scientific advisor. So I am not surprised that he has had that response, but it is certainly something 
um, that we will follow up on. In regards to the specific question they asked in regards to the, the easing of restrictions on regulations, that process has now been handled by the Executive's COVID Task Force in regards to what steps we actually use and utilise, uh, as was set out in the Executive's COVID uh, Task Force pathway. And I think there is a step, if I remember correctly, under sport, that that is one of the natural steps that we take because of the, the affiliated uh, organisations and sporting activities have that ability to uh, actually manage and control the requirements that are necessary to allow those restrictions to be relaxed. But it is my hope that we get to a point very soon in regards to our, our vaccination uptake and the low numbers that we are seeing in hospital admissions and people in ICUs that we can move quickly and steadily along that pathway to allow as normal approach to return to Northern Ireland as is possible. Call Paula Bradshaw for a question. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, members in this chamber may recall earlier this year when the research report into mother and baby homes was launched, I did not share in their enthusiasm. I um, was frustrated that after many years of banging the door of your department with the birth mothers and their children for justice, um, that finally they were getting a bit of attention. I was um, very, very upset last week when I met with the birth mothers and I um, heard stories of social workers who were meant to reply from a month ago. In terms of the family tracing service, no response. They had reached out for counselling again, month, six weeks ago, had no response. Can you please outline how the health services and support that your department is providing to the birth mothers is being monitored and that people who, who have been re traumatised by the launch of this report are make, you're making sure that they are getting the support that they're asking for? Thank you. Uh, and again, and, and I, the member will note that the report was co sponsored by the executive office and and my department as well in regards to the work that has been done. That management board now has been established. And the specifics that the member raises in regards to social workers and access, if she could write to me, uh, I would appreciate that so we could follow up on the specifics of those individual cases as well, because it's not something that I want to reflect. When we did uh, launch that report from our side, it was a necessary piece of work. It was a long overdue piece of work. And I think I gave the members their assurance at that time that we would put as much effort into support the, mo the birth mothers uh, as is possible. So I am disappointed to hear of those failings, of those gaps, but certainly I will follow up with the member in regards to the detail that she raises. Supplementary for Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, um, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your commitment. I, I take you in, in, in your sincerity there. I am concerned also, um, you will be aware, that the Executive Office has started a reference group into historical clerical uh, child sex abuse. Um, you will be aware that the likes of Nexus, who provide counselling for sexual abuse um, victims, they have got, I think, probably hundreds, um, maybe over 500 people on their waiting list. I am concerned, Minister, as, as this gets a bit of momentum, a wee bit more um, public discussion around, around bringing people forward for, um, you know, to um, almost disclose that they have been a victim, that the support, again, is not going to be there for them. Can we maybe preempt that a wee bit and maybe make sure that the, the counselling is in place there for this very sensitive area of counselling? Thank you. And again, I thank the member for her very specific question in regards to what is a very sensitive but important uh, piece of work. So those support mechanisms should be there. And I know we have engaged with fundering community organisations to be there as a backup and as a support in many cases. But again, in the specific that she asked, I will follow up and get back to her. Here, I'm sorry, Jerry Kelly for your cash. I call Jerry Kelly. Good morning, uh, last one, Could you ask the minister? Uh, could you give an update on the development of a long-term autism strategy, please? I, th I thank the, the member for for his his questions in regards to the, the long overdue update on on an autism strategy. Um, I'm aware because of the increase in waiting lists for autism assessments and the distress that this has caused for children and families who are managing challenging circumstances. And the current pandemic has actually exacerbated some of that. So, in regards to the specifics of the autism strategy, it is something that we are progressing. Um, and I announced the consultation on that, I believe, uh, a few weeks ago. But I'll get the specifics again in regards to to the dates and how to access that to the member in writing. Okay, Jerry Kelly, supplementary for Jerry Kelly. Going back to would the Minister um, commit to involving those who have autism, their families, carers, and the wide range of uh, community and voluntary sector uh, groups which uh, would also assist in designing a future autism strategy? 
And again, I thank the member for, for, for it. As, as I said, uh, he may be aware that I, I did recently announce uh, and published an interim autism strategy, and action within that strategy is to implement a new framework um, of care to deliver a proactive, integrated, and streamlined pathway for children and young people across the region, and to provide a range of early intervention approaches and support to meet their needs and that of families and carers. And I'll make sure that that does include service users and those who uh, depend on these services to make sure there is that level of co production and co design. I think what we have to do is wait until the end of question time for points of order, if that's all right. Thank you. Um, okay, that concludes topical questions. And uh, members, if we just take our ease until we move to the next uh, question session, which will be with the Minister for Infrastructure. Yep. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, no, I mean the end of question time, as in the end of infrastructure questions as well, uh, column. The end of the period of question time. Sorry about that. Yeah, you got it.